So I'd like to welcome Dr. Stephanie Fay tonight. As CEO of Australian Trade and Investment Commission, Stephanie has great personal and professional experience enabling her to offer insights into what's driving and I think inhibiting Australia's trade with our neighbours. I think we can all be proud that Stephanie was Australia's first female chief executive. She was previously EY's lead partner for education in the Oceania region, deputy vice chancellor global engagement at Monash University and director of the University of Sydney's Research Institute for Asia and the Pacific. So Dr Fay has over 30 years experience both as an academic and executive working in Australia and overseas and of course brings all that international perspective tonight uh, and her wealth of experience of course in business, academia and public service. So I think tonight she's not letting Australia or us rest on our laurels of economic growth. Although Australia might be a low risk, safe environment and we have solid policy and institutions, there are of course questions about facing the conditions of our, our dynamic region and the uncertain future that we all face in uh, issues of change. So please do welcome Stephanie to talk with us this evening and she's very happy to take questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zara, for that very warm welcome. And I'm very happy to be here tonight. And when I look around the room, I see a number of friends and former colleagues. So it's always wonderful to come to a place uh, where you know uh, people in the audience. Uh, the Griffith Asia Institute has played a leading role in Asian studies since the 1970s and indeed in shaping Australia's engagement with Asia. So when I received this invitation, I was very pleased to accept. And what a place to have the lecture. I had the opportunity to do a tour of the gallery uh, before coming in here tonight, uh, the wonderful GOMA. Uh, it's one of my favourite galleries across in Australia, and it's a landmark building and a quintessential part of the Brisbane experience. So we thought it would be appropriate to display a painting that Austrade had commissioned from a, a, an artist in, in Perth, just uh, north east of Perth. Uh, his name is Bradley Kickett and he is a Noongar man. Uh, and the title of this painting is called Trade Grounds. Uh, and we asked him to do a painting of Aboriginal trade trading lines. And so you'll see trading lines from the sea and going inland. And so we use this uh, on our reconciliation action plan, but also to remind our staff that trade didn't start with Australia with white settlement. So trade between Australia and Asia has been going on for several centuries and it could be several thousands of years. So, in 1921, Australia appointed its first trade commissioner. Many in the room won't be surprised that in 1921, we sent a Brit. We sent Edward Little to represent Australian commercial interests. So Little was posted to Shanghai and the business community criticised his appointment, saying there'd been a lack of consultation. Now that sounds familiar. <laughs> uh, the Age newspaper decried it as a waste of government money and an overreach of the government's role. And that's also quite interesting now being as part of government and our role is to uh, work to support Australian exporters and also to bring foreign direct investment into Australia. Although it wasn't popular at the time for politicians to talk about the role of Asia in boosting Australia's fortunes, it was well known and accepted amongst policy makers. So writing to the then Prime Minister Billy Hughes a year after Little departed for China, John Bly Sutter New South Wales commercial agent to Japan said the following. He had every confidence 
in the East as Australia's great trading centre of the future, of which Japan will, and for a long time, be the leading country, more especially in regard to wool, metals, wheat, and later on meat and other food supplies. So that was in the 1920s. So the foresight that he displayed uh, is something that I don't think we often reflect on. So if, as I said earlier, of course Australia's trading history with Asia began long before Australia's parliament came into being or before Edward Little was sent off to China on our behalf. Indigenous Australians of northeast Arnhem Land had traded pearls and trepang or sea cucumber with the Makassan sailors for centuries. Australia, thanks to its geography, has quite literally had to, had to always go the extra mile to succeed in international trade. In 1921, that meant dedicating resources to building commercial ties as well as our diplomatic ties across Asia. So what does it mean today in 2019 to go the extra mile? So we're in the throes of the fourth industrial revolution and there are significant shifts in key trading relationships across our, our region. What does it mean to go the extra mile to ensure our nation's prosperity? I spend a lot of my time contemplating this very question. The answer, I believe, lies in great part in how we continue to engage with Asia, home to two thirds of the world's middle class by, 2020, by 2030. So I'll just repeat that number. Asia is going to be home to two thirds of the world's middle class by 2030. So Asia, the world's fastest growing economic region, is already home to 10 of Australia's top 12 export markets. And going forward, I believe we must continue to be bold in our ambitions. We need to be rigorous in our strategy, policy and ex execution and mindful of the great role that Asia-Australian relationships have had in shaping the society that we enjoy today. So no doubt many of you read or saw the headlines in the recent Australian Fin Review article, which was titled, Australia, Rich, Dumb and Getting Dumber. So it, this article was based on Harvard's Atlas of Economic Complexity, where Australia ranks as the eighth richest nation in the study, but its economic complexity had fallen from 93, fallen to 93 out of 133 countries in just two decades. So in 1995 to 2017. Australia in this study ranks poorly, somewhere between Senegal and Pakistan. And thanks to our failure, the researchers argue, to capitalise on the resources boom to create the industries we need to maintain our position amongst the top ranks of the developed world. I confess Harvard's research and the AFR article provided the inspiration for tonight's presentation. It laid out a pessimistic view of our nation's economic prospects. And hearing this country called dumb was somewhat irritating to say the least. Every day in the course of my work, I meet Australian innovators, taking their bold ideas to the world. Many of these tech innovators are born out of our traditional sectors such as agriculture and mining. So it's not surprising that we have ag tech that's emerged from our agriculture industry and what we call METs that's arised, ar arisen out of our mining industry. But we're not limited to those traditional sectors. 
we have unicorns in this country, uh, and some of you will know the names of these companies, some may not. So Atlassian uh, is now uh, a global phenomenon. And if you look at the top rich list in Australia, the two founders of Atlassian rank about four, five in the country. So that's happened in the last 10 years. I actually sit on the Australian Brand Council and Mike Cannon-Brooks, who's one of the founders, sits on that council. And Alan Joyce from Qantas is another person who sits on the council, Andrew Forrest, and Mike Cannon-Brooks outranks both of them. <laughs> uh, interesting dynamics. Uh, so Atlassian is a software company, uh, and if I just uh, try to generalise what they do, they sell software to the software developers. Canva is another household name in Austrade, and they are another unicorn, which means that they're worth over a billion dollars, and with a female founder, and they sell software again, and it's for developing presentations, so for um, a commercial output. Fantastic. It, people who don't know how to do presentations or graphics, graphic design, they can make you look like an expert. So they've also gone global and they're just going into China. So these two companies are unicorns. They've grown to a billion dollars in a very short period of time. So meeting these people makes me optimistic about Australia's future. These entrepreneurs and businesses are forging strong ties with partners and peers across our region. Of course, many were quick to point out a significant flaw in the Harvard ranking uh, because they argue that services were not included. We export goods and it was, they say the analysis was based on the goods we export. It didn't include the services that we export because services don't go through customs. So we know in Australia that over 70% of our economy is services. So it's a very significant part of our economy. But when we look at the export component, only 20% or a little over 20% of our exports are services. So we are underrepresented, but they didn't count services. And if you look at global exports, global exports, 40% of global exports are in the services. So we are underdone, but nevertheless, uh, when they did this analysis, uh, yes, our top three exports are coal, gas and iron ore, but if you look at the fourth and fifth, the fourth and fifth are actually in services, education and tourism. So from the world's first electronic pace, heart pacemaker to the ultra, ultrasound scanner, the bionic ear, the black box, LAN, Wi-Fi, 3D metal printing, Australians have taken their ingenuity to the world over the past century. So innovation in Australia is part of our DNA. But as the saying goes, necessity is the mother of invention. And Australia has developed many remarkable solutions to meet our most pressing needs. So for example, the driverless self-automated trucks and trains to cover vast distances, particularly in the mining area, is just an example. And this expression, uh, the uh, necessity is the mother of invention, actually came home to me very clearly when I was in China last week. So I had the opportunity to accompany our minister, our trade minister, Minister Birmingham, to the China International Import Expo. Uh, and we took a number of Australian companies uh, and selling a number of uh, 200 different brands, uh, Australian brands. But while I was there, I had the opportunity to uh, visit uh, Kunshan, Suzhou, and Hangzhou. Hangzhou is the home 
of Alibaba. And any of you who are familiar with what's going on in China will know about Alibaba. You can buy anything on Alibaba. Uh, but we also got to meet uh, people in the medical profession. And they were using AI in all of their devices and collecting data and trying to provide services at a high level using medical devices. And the thing that struck me was in the context of some of our staff saying, in China, we've got no choice but to go with technology and remote delivery of these services because we've got 1.3 billion people and if you want an appointment with a doctor, doesn't matter how much money you've got, you'll have to wait three months. Uh, a doctor will see up to 120 patients a day, so you're lucky if you get to see a doctor for three minutes. So they say that if, we, if in China they're to improve their health services, they have to incorporate technology into their health system because they say we have a third world health system in this country. So it's not surprising then that every company that we visited in the health industry area were pushing AI, artificial intelligence, collection of data, remote uh, servicing uh, for patients. They've got no choice. And the same with education. So many students, and we have so many students from China coming here because the local universities can't offer the education at the standard of what is required. So again, they're starting to use technology. So it's not surprising that China is now the leader in artificial intelligence in the world. And that's not going to change anytime soon. So a report that was done by Boston Consulting said that 85% of all Chinese companies have some form of artificial intelligence or algorithms uh, driving the analysis of information. 85% of all their companies had some form of AI embedded within them. And it compared uh, China to the US and they said, US companies in Silicon Valley, most of them have got some form of AI embedded, whether it's deep learning or whether it's natural language analysis. There are lots, um, AI is this umbrella term for lots of different types of analytics. Uh, but in the US, they said it's Sil Silicon Valley, some of the startups, but just about nowhere else. When I look at Australia, and how many companies in Australia have AI embedded? Very few. When I go to the universities and I ask uh, those who are running MBAs and I say, have you got data analytics or have you got artificial intelligence components in your MBAs? Most of them say no. So, it makes you wonder how Australia is going to compete on the global stage as these businesses continue to globalise. So, given that China is a leader in artificial intelligence and they are investing billions in artificial intelligence, I don't see that that position is going to change anytime soon. So, where does that leave Australia? Uh, in the, on the global stage. And Ushi Schreiber, some of you may know her, uh, she's a member of the global executive board of Ernst & Young, but she was also the former head of health here in Queensland. She's recently called for a national conversation on how Australia will respond to the seismic economic and social changes that are underway. So Ushi notes that Australia has slipped four places in the World Bank's ease of doing business rankings to number 18 in 2019. So to put that in context, New Zealand is number one in terms of ease of doing business. 
our world digital ranking also shows a decline in our knowledge, technology and future readiness. Colleagues of mine who work for multinationals in Australia tell me that they struggle with their overseas headquarters to get them to invest in innovation in Australia, to take Australia seriously as a site for, in, for investment in innovation. And Australian businesses also are not investing in innovation despite government incentives. So how will we ensure that Australia's unicorns of Atlassian and Canvas, Canva, uh, the Agaris and Air Wallachs are not anomalies in our export profile, but they become the norm? Do we feel the urgency to step things up, particularly in regard to our trading partners in Asia? So this is no time to be complacent. And even though Australia has enjoyed 28 years of uninterrupted economic growth, and in September, we achieved 21 consecutive monthly trade surpluses, it's still no time to be complacent. And some people might argue it's because of these statistics that we are not innovating. So we've prospered thanks in large part to our abundant resources. So mining accounts for about 10% of the Australian economy. And with the production of iron ore and coal, almost entirely reliant on exports, they made up 30% of our total exports in 2017-18. So 30% of our exports were made up by iron ore and coal. Very little value added there. There's no doubt a weaker glo global trading environment is making trade more challenging for Australian exporters. And so we are not immune to the lower global GDP growth or the uncertainty that impacts, uh, that impacts trade flows, business confidence and investment. So I'd like to say a little about China, uh, and you'll see as these uh, slides move through, there's a photograph of our trade minister cutting the ribbon at the Australian pavilion. Uh, so as I said, I was there last week along with 140 businesses from Australia representing over 200 brands, and they were everything from food and beverages, agribusiness, med tech, and health solutions. The fundamentals that underpin our economic relationship with China remain strong. And the good news from my perspective is that the conversations that we had in China this last week were very positive conversations. And those who have followed the Australia-China relationship over the last couple of years know that that hasn't always been the case. So we're optimistic about the future and the future for Australian business. But as we know, the relationship has uh, much depth, but also has much volatility. So there are a few areas where we direct, there are very few areas where we directly compete. But it was interesting, uh, last year I attended a joint presentation of academics from China and from Australia. And the Chinese academics actually pointed out in, that in the 1980s, Australia and China were competitors on the global stage in terms of what we exported. So they were exporting minerals, they were exporting food because they needed foreign currency. But our relationship with China has changed quite dramatically, that we are complementary in almost every respect. And we've got much to gain from our collaboration and knowledge sharing. And, but obviously, uh, we don't embark on this relationship naively. And we've come, to this, we've come this far because of being bold and collaborative, instituting strong policy reforms, securing uh, the China-Australia Free Trade Agreement, 
which we call CHAFTA, and working hard to develop our long-held people-to-people ties. China is our largest export market, with almost a third of our exports going to China. I think it's an important number to remember. So when uh, there's discussion about uh, our engagement with China and perhaps we should be pulling back from China, I think it's important to remember that a third of our exports go to China at the moment. And for some states in this country, it's much higher. And when you translate that into how many jobs depend on our relationship with China, it's quite salutary. So even over the course of the past year, amid the US-China trade tensions, our exports with China have increased by 26%. You would have thought from the media that it was in a hole, but it's actually increased by 26%, and it's boosting our economy by 135 billion in one year. So the Australian brand is strong in China, and not just our premium goods and resources, Around 1.43 million people from China visit Australia uh, up to, they visited in the year up to June 2019. And they spend 12 million billion on their travels. So 12 billion is spent by Chinese visitors to our country in one year. But it's very interesting to actually look at that number because Chinese students are incredibly important in that figure, accounting for almost seven billion. So that's over half of the visitor spend of Chinese visitors who come to Australia are actually associated with education in some way. So at Austrade, we spend quite a bit of time uh, developing our relationship with China. Uh, earlier in the year, we hosted the Festival of Australia and the numbers uh, who were involved will surprise you. Uh, Austrade, together with a number of partners, organised 41 events in 11 cities, and we engaged, this is my new word, KOLs. I don't know if everybody, anybody knows what a KOL is, but a KOL is a key opinion leader. So in China, you, you will have people who will film uh, events and then people will watch them on, their, on the internet. Uh, so during that two week period at the Festival Australia and when we engage with some of these KOLs, over 90 million people viewed Australian products during that two week period, 90 million people. Our minister was thrilled when he was in Shanghai last week because he was working uh, with the MLA and they were teaching him how to cook a steak. Our minister, you can just tell by the way he shakes the pan and cuts the vegetables that he's cooked uh, more than a steak in his past. But we had a KOL who was filming him and at the beginning of the lesson, uh, which had a huge audience, uh, there were about... 700,000 watching because they follow this particular woman, Momo. But by the time he finished cooking his steak, there were 11.2 million people watching him cook a steak. Uh, so he was pretty happy about that. And he said that he was going to go home and tell the PM that uh, he had... Uh, 11.2 million people watching him and to ask the PM when was the last time you had 11.2 million people watching you. Uh, so I don't know how that conversation went. <laughs> uh, so when we market to China, we really do need to do it in a different way and we need to engage in social media. Uh, and, but the technology, uh, the point that I'm trying to make is that people live by their mobile phones and what they can watch on their mobile phone. And they communicate through WeChat. They purchase 
using platforms like Alibaba or JD.com. But the other thing that I learnt when I was there this time is that I couldn't understand why eBay had lost traction in the US and Alibaba had basically pushed them out. And if you read the Australian newspapers, you think it's a conspiracy because it's a, an American company. It's not actually. On Alibaba, when you buy something, you get to bargain. So the person who's selling the good will be on the other end of the purchase and you can say, well, you know, can't you decrease the price? Are you going to throw in uh, the shipping for free? So it's the same sort of banter that you might have had 20 years ago when you go to the market. You can't do that on eBay. So shopping on Alibaba is entertainment and it's, it's also culturally appropriate and people like to do it. So I don't think there was any big conspiracy about pushing eBay out as an American company. It just didn't suit the way in which Chinese like to purchase, like to shop. So I think there's, I think we need to be very careful when we uh, make assumptions about things that happen in China and how we might interpret them. I just wanted to uh, conclude by uh, saying a little about other countries. China's not the only uh, country with whom we engage. Uh, I'd also like to talk a little bit about Japan uh, because I was in Japan about a month ago and we had a joint conference between business uh, in Australia and Japan. The sense that I had there was that Japan and Australia are very closely aligned. We are supporting open economies, the rule of law. Japanese investors come to Australia. They enjoy their experience in Australia because they say, we can trust Australia. You do business in the same way we do business. Uh, and it's one of those relationships which is uncontentious. And you travel around the world in my, in my job at the moment, you go to the US, there it's contentious. You go to China, there are still, there are elements of contention. You go to Japan and we're friends and it, you don't really notice it until everybody else has changed, but the relationship between Australia and Japan has basically stayed the same. But Japanese, Investors in Australia are very quiet investors. Uh, they have, they're also some of the largest investors in Australia. A single largest investment that came into the Northern Territory, Western Australia, the Northern Territory, went into IMPEX and it's LNG uh, mining and export development. Uh, we now uh, are sending gas, LNG, to Japan. We, we provide 10% of their LNG. It was a $49 billion investment in one investment, and that's growing. And that investment will make Australia, by 2020, the largest LNG exporter in the world. So investment in Australia from different countries around the world actually turbocharges our industries. And you hear a lot of uh, discussion around selling off the farm. We, we shouldn't be, set, we shouldn't be uh, accepting foreign direct investment into this country because they're buying up all our assets. But in fact, when you're as close to it as we are and we see that a Japanese company or a Chinese company might invest 40%, acquire 40% of a company, that often provides the capital that will allow that business to grow. So the, the business might triple in size. So the 40% share that might have been held by Japanese or Chinese investors, the value actually triples, but so does the ownership, so does the, uh, the profits, 
that would be staying in Australia. And a number of our companies are actually capital starved. So they don't only bring capital, but they also bring uh, expertise and technology. So that technology that I was talking about before, uh, if Australian companies are to remain competitive, then where are we going to get that injection of, of technology and of investment? So I'd now like to finish on uh, a, an exciting note for us. Uh, about 18 months ago, uh, you, you may be aware that there was the release of the foreign policy white paper from DFAT. And there was a lot of consultation that was done for that foreign policy white paper. And one of the calls from business in the foreign policy white paper is to say, we need a nation brand. Because when we show up overseas, we have lots of different brands, we have all the states and territories, and as our former trade minister would say, when we show up at a trade event overseas, it looks like a hawker's market. You can't even see Australia there. So how do we actually know that this is Australia? So the government asked us to work together with industry to develop the nation brand. So it's led by industry, enabled by government. And it's not the same as you would have a brand for a product. You don't, it's not a logo and a tagline. When you develop a nation brand, it's a national narrative. How do you show up overseas and how do you describe yourself as a country? That's a pretty tough call. Uh, so we worked on it together with Andrew Forrest, Alan Joyce, Mike Cannon-Brooks from Atlassian, uh, Jane Hardlicker from A2 Milk, uh, Edwina McCann from Vogue, uh, Wesley Enoch from the Sydney Festival, who's uh, Indigenous background, people from education, people from lots of... Christine Holgate from Australia Post. There were 12 of us with very big personalities and very strong opinions about what they sh thought should happen. But we worked on this challenge, and I think we've come up with something pretty smart. Uh, the first thing we had to do is to try to identify what the personality of Australia is. How can you, but how can you actually distill the personality of a country that's so diverse as Australia? So what we've come up with is that we said, Australians, by and large, are optimistic. But they're not naively optimistic. In fact, Mike Cannon-Brooks said this. He said, my company's been very successful and I've been optimistic, but I've had to work really hard to make that work. So it's optimism with grit. So it's an irrepressible sense of optimism. And then you also need to have words that uh, describe parts of your nation that you want to dial up and others that you want to maintain. So when we did some analysis and we check all the rankings around the world, we do really well on Australia is a beautiful place. Everybody seems to think Australia is a beautiful place. We also do really well on, yes, Australia has great people, friendly people. Is Australia a creative country? Mm, it was a bit uh, uneven. Are we innovative? Are we at the cutting edge of technology? Nowhere to be seen. So this is when they poll around the world. So what we had to do is to dial up that side, not necessarily dial down beautiful place, great people, but to dial up the other side. Uh, so what we've done is to work on a nation brand and words that we think describe us, ourselves, so optimistic, but we also see ourselves as trustworthy, uh, working hard. There's a number of words that we've used to describe ourselves. Uh, and then we've come up with a visual, a visual representation. Uh, 
the visual representation hasn't been released yet, so I can't say too much about it, but it has several layers. So when you do see it, it looks beautiful uh, if you're just looking at the visual representation. But when you actually start digging into the brand, uh, it's got some elements to it that the geologists will think, uh, that, now that's very clever, and the digital companies will say, oh, that's very clever. So not everybody needs to understand that or are engaged in it, but there are these different layers by which uh, we can actually unpack the nation brand. And instead of telling people we're clever, they just look at what we've done and they say, hmm, that's clever. So on that note, I'm going to close. <laughs> Thank you so much, Stephanie. I know that we, are, um, we have a little bit of time for some questions. If you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand and we've got some microphones around the room and I think we have our first question just over there. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much um, uh, for Dr. Stephanie Fahey. Um, um, uh, I'm a Chinese PhD student here in media, medic uh, media communication. I'm also a former uh, journalist in Russia. I mean, what I want to ask, like, uh, it's a very brilliant speech about the uh, uh, perspective of the, uh, between China and Russia, the future economic cooperation. Uh, but uh, by what, what I can see right now in the alternative media, the narrative and discourse uh, to portray China is totally uh, contradictory to what we are trying to see right now. I mean, uh, it, I, I need to apologize before I see next things. I, I need to apologize. I mean, and maybe they displease you. And we might just get, if you don't yeah. mind, just coming to the question. Okay, yeah. We've got a you, few. You talk about AI, but uh, Australian media think AI may control Xinjiang and relocation camp. Uh, Chinese students are maybe something uh, still technological information and something WeChat censorship, all, all the things, you know, like. And uh, what I'm trying to say is that how, I mean, how training government balance, they can balance the, the, their economic uh, uh, benefits and their political, I mean, will, is the first thing. Second thing is I want to ask about right now, the, the security hawks, uh, I mean, they control the China policy, right? And uh, they are not very friendly to China, but which will influence the future economic cooperation between Australia and China for sure. How do you do this as well? Solve the problem, that's all. Thank you very much. Yeah. So I could understand the last question, and that is around the economic relationship. And I think you said the security hawks are determining the relationship between Australia and China. Yeah. So perhaps if I address that question first, uh, Austrade works together with business. And as I said, when we took the businesses to China, uh, those businesses have been, many of them have been trading with China for 20, 30 years. So those people-to-people -people ties are still there and they're still very strong. And I don't think it's only Australia and China where business gets on with things. Uh, the, polit the politicians do what they do and business does what they do. Uh, and I think in China's history, that's been the case as well. Uh, so I was actually very encouraged to see those relationships between business. Uh, and as I said, if you read the newspapers, you would have thought that the trade relationship with, between Australia and China was in dire straits. But in fact, the the trade has increased in value by 26%, and it's a huge number. Our trade, two-way trade with China is number one for Australia and has been for a decade. So for it to increase by 26% is just mind-boggling. And that's in a time where there has, there's been a lot of con conversation between the politicians, but business have just kept getting on with it. Uh, another interesting observation that I found when I was in China is I went to Alibaba's store uh, and they, they aut they've automated a lot of their grocery store. But what they've also done is develop a very close relationship with Starbucks. So they say now Chinese shoppers want to drink 
coffee while they're shopping. They've got a shopping trolley. They've got a little uh, pos uh, position or a, a space on their shopping trolley to put a takeaway coffee. So they can just order their coffee and then somebody comes around, finds them with their trolley because they know which trolley you're at. They put the coffee in. And I said to the woman from Alibaba, I thought there was a trade war between China and the US. And here you are, a very significant Chinese company developing such a close relationship with Starbucks. How does that happen? Mm. That was the response. Mm. So it's, it's very interesting. So I think it's more complicated than what we read in the newspapers. And I wasn't quite sure about the first question. It was about AI. No, I think it's a very good question. And I think about that a lot as well. And that's why I raised this issue of why I think China's going down the AI route, uh, especially with respect to health that they've got no choice but to use technology to improve the service because they've got so many people. Uh, and what, peop what you've just outlined is probably true, uh, but I don't think that's the major intention. It's not only that issue where China is developing uh, technology. They're developing technology to service their 1.3 billion people. Uh, so I think we need to keep that discussion in balance as well. So we can't attribute the technology investment in China just to that issue. I think there are much broader issues driving technology in China. Uh, thank you very much for your speech. I'm going to continue on with the China theme. Um, I've heard many times now that uh, on a geopolitical or political level, there's a lot of, um, I guess, tension in the relationship, but business continues to move on in a very positive fashion. What do we really need to be worried about then, I guess? Because I've just heard this consistently. You know, we do get along um, on a business front and, you know, the relationship on a people-to-people -people level is quite positive. I guess, what concerns do you have um, in, in that trading relationship, excluding what's happening on that political front? Mm. When you listen to what the Chinese say about Australia, they say the wealth in Australia has come about because you've been able to export coal, iron ore, gas to us, and you're not thankful. If it wasn't for us, your economy wouldn't have grown in the way it did. But you can flip that and you can say, China's economy wouldn't have grown as it has if it didn't have a trusted partner to provide the resources that they needed to grow. So it, that complementarity between the economies is real and you can see it from either side but in, in fact the complementarity term I think is a really important word to keep using with respect to our two economies. But it's always better to be uh, trading with a country where the relationship is friendly uh, because uh, when you go to China and many of you who are in business or in the university sector will have had this experience and people will uh, say what they need to say about uh, Australia's public statements on certain things that China's been doing and that's their responsibility to say it as party officials usually uh, and then you get on with business. But it, it would back in the honeymoon phase when you went to China, it was much more fun, I can say. Uh, you would, uh, it was very enjoyable to have those sorts of relationships. So I think where you can have more cordial relationships, it's more comfortable for everyone. And I think on the Australian side, I think what uh, the expectation from China of us is that we won't prosecute our differences through the media. 
They would prefer us to prosecute our differences with them in meetings. Uh, so it's not always easy to do that in a country where you've got a free press, and we do have a free press, by and large. <laughs> uh, by and large. Uh, so I think that um, how, you, how you manage the diplomatic relationship with China is something that we're just learning. And one of our most experienced diplomats, John McCarthy, who was uh, ambassador in Japan, he's been ambassador in India, he was ambassador in, uh, ambassador in Indonesia uh, during the East Timor trouble. Uh, so very experienced ambassador. And he gave a presentation six months ago and he said, China, China has shared boundaries with India. They have uh, Japan across the sea and we can learn a lot from Japan and India in the way in which they engage with China. Uh, they haven't been taken over by China. They are still very independent countries, uh, but they've been able to be quite tactical in the way they've handled the relationship. Our relationship with China is relatively young. So we, uh, it depends how you think about it, the trading relationship since probably the 80s, but we know that Chinese came to Australia in the 1800s, the mid-1800s. So there's been a, a lot of Chinese in Australia. But in terms of the trading relationship, our political and our trading relationship is relatively young. Uh, and as we go along that path, I think we will develop ways of talking to each other and accepting our differences because we are different. All right. I'm going to give the vote of thanks. Um, and I think everyone will join with me in thanking you, Stephanie, for a really fabulous discussion. <laughs> and don't get up just yet, because I do need to say a couple of things that really stood out. Firstly, can I say thank you for tackling that Harvard project, because that needed some tackling. I remember in 2010 when Simon Unholt who is a nation brand consultant, came out to Australia and talked about us as the dumb blonde of the Asia region. <laughs> Decorative, but not very useful. That's uh, exactly what he said. <laughs> yes. Those are the kinds of statements that we actually do need to uh, rebut and give reason for rebutting. And I thought it was fabulous that you began with some historical perspectives. The Indigenous perspective, of course, and I think increasingly we are growing in our awareness of just how important mm -hmm. those linkages that the Indigenous communities of Arnhem, Arnhem Land made for us within our own region. But also the colonies uh, and the way that Queensland as a colony um, before Federation, really established links into the Pacific. Not all of them easy, some of them problematic. But nonetheless, commerce really paved the way for Australia's engagement. I hadn't heard about Edward Little uh, previously. We'll have to look him up. But, but commerce and our commercial links uh, have always been important to the way Australia related and relates to its region. And I think that, that, that we've always recognised our fortunes lie in our own neighbourhood. Um, and today, that's probably more relevant than ever. It is one of the most dynamic and diverse regions of the world on every measure. And I think you spoke to that brilliantly. You know, whether we're talking about technology or we're talking about development, there is an unevenness that we have to um, be able to accommodate and, and understand. As a big island, continent, not rubbing shoulders necessarily with other players. Sometimes I guess it's easy to become a little insular. Um, but, but one of the things that gives me great hope is the fact that, that our, the next generation of our leaders, our students, are actually doing things a little bit differently to the way that we did it. And they are, we've just sent 55 undergrad students out into the region to work um, across a number of destinations. They are shaking things up. They're learning new skills. They're building new networks and friendships and relationships that I think will be for the benefit or to the benefit of us going forward. Um, 
and they will be navigating this very uneven landscape and hopefully being unicorns in their own right. So I think we've got a lot to be optimistic about. And just finally, I think it's fantastic uh, that you actually foreshadowed the release of the Nation brand, Optimism with Grit. Can I say, if it's a visual, that this is a really good place to be talking about that when it is launched. So we would love to invite you back uh, at that stage. Great. Um, because this is, you know, a wonderful venue where we can explore the visual and understand the layers of meaning within. Uh, and we have fantastic partners who can help us through that process as well. So once again, Stephanie, thank you so much. Um, before we formally close this evening, can I also just note, this brings the 2019 Perspectives Asia year formally to an end. It's been really fantastic to have the support of so many of you throughout the year, and, and we've travelled some ground together, um, from the back streets of Manila, uh, to I think we've been in the South Pacific talking about munitions uh, retrieval, to cyberspace. Um, we've covered a great deal of ground and this has been a fabulous venue for us to unpack some of the difficult and challenging issues that we face in the way that we engage here in Australia with our own region. I'd like um, in particular to thank our partners here at Quagoma who are just fantastic to work with, in particular Zara and Ruth. Uh, and I'd also like to thank my boss, Professor David Grant, who heads up the business school and is here tonight. David, alongside Chris Sains, the director of Quagoma, you give us enormous freedom to explore some topics and we're very thankful to you for that. And it's great to have you here this evening. Next year, we begin our 15th year of partnership, and we look forward to seeing you all back uh, for another series of Perspectives Asia. In the meantime, have a very safe Christmas. It seems a bit weird to be saying that already. Uh, a really fabulous and safe Christmas and New Year, and we look forward to seeing you in 2020. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. And I have a